So, in this sixth lecture talk, I want to look at some of the theories as to why there was a change from cyclical to progressive time in the Renaissance and a little later. Because as Keith Thomas, who I uh, quoted before, wrote, it is one of the great mysteries of intellectual history why this new concept of time and history emerged. Thomas himself has a quote, hazards a guess uh, by saying that what is most necessary to produce a sense of time, uh, of change, sorry, is the fact of change. I quote again, in particular, it takes discernible technological or intellectual movement to drive into the minds of contemporaries an awareness of the differences between their world and that of their ancestors. Clearly, if we now look back to uh, 50 years ago and think about a world so different technologically from our own, uh, we have a sense of some rapid changes. But in many agrarian societies, hardly anything changed over a 50-year period of a, a life experience, let alone over some hundreds of years. Yes, if you take this uh, approach, which sounds quite sensible, there's a puddle, puzzle for technical, technological change was not new in the 15th, 16th century. And this is recognized by Keith Thomas. It's true that there had been a great deal of technological progress throughout the Middle Ages. But it is also true, though puzzling, that its psychological effects seem to have been very slight before the 15th or 16th centuries. It certainly generated no diffused concept of technological progress. So why didn't people notice that you now had uh, windmills, uh, new kinds of water mills, um, and so on? And this was a change. Um, well, let's go into it in a little more detail. Let's start with the tools of communication, the ones that affect the, the brain and the mind, the intellectual. And the first of these is the development of writing and literacy. Of course, writing is very old, far beyond this period. Um, but it is very important, as Jack Goody and others have pointed out, to give you a sense of change, because if you write down things, and then someone reads them a hundred years later, they notice that there's been some change. Our minds, our oral histories and experiences can easily adapt to change without noticing it. But when things are written down, it's inscribed on something which then keeps it in a kind of historical frame. Um, you could put it as follows. Uh, in traditional societies, changes can occur but where people cannot, quote, refer back to the idea of a former generation frozen in writing, both those responsible for the adjustments and those who accept them remain virtually unaware that innovation has taken place. In these circumstances, everything tends to give the main tenets of theory an absolute and timeless validity, the works of great founding fathers, whether it's Confucius or Mencius or the prophet or uh, the Buddha are timeless and always valid. I continue the quotation, where literacy begins to spread widely through a community, the situation changes radically. The beliefs of a particular period become frozen in writing. The possibility of checking current beliefs against the frozen ideas of an earlier era throws the fact of change into sharp relief. Thus, for example, um, and this is um, now Horton, that was uh, Keith Thomas, now Robin Horton, in the reawakening of the 12th to 17th centuries, a great expansion and democratization of literacy was the precursor of the final enduring reappearance of the open predicament and the scientific outlook. This is Robin Horton. And Peter Burke also singles out the growth of literacy as one of the factors 
unquote, which probably affected attitudes to history and to time. Literacy is spreading, but it's not a dramatic shift in the 15th century, for example. The thing that does dramatically shift in the 15th century is printing. The development of printing occurs just at the right time and the right place to produce the right effect. In other words, the second half of the 15th century and the 16th century. Possible ways in which it could alter concepts of time and history are suggested by Keith Thomas. I quote, Printing certainly did much to emphasise the difference between the present and the past. For every book had a date of publication, and those which survived stood as monuments to past assumptions and ideas. You'd have the date of publication. Old books, like old buildings or old genealogies, were relics of the past, but unlike buildings or genealogies, could not be silently adapted to suit the needs of new generations. That's the end of the quote. Thus, there grew up a sense of development, of serial growth. New books, new thoughts emerge. It's not merely a matter of copying as you do as a scribe with written texts in, in hand, portions of the classical authorities. In a sense, the printing press, as no doubt Marshall McLuhan would argue, not only gives man the power to manufacture new meanings with machines, it also gives them a serial and lineal view of truth as lines of print. Truth is now constructed as a line of print and above all it's palpably a technology which no ancient or medieval civilization had available at least in Europe the Chinese had printing from much earlier of course but the Romans didn't print and we do print big change it made a gap another technology which uh, shifted things suggested are the tools of time, clocks and watches, clocks particularly at the beginning. The spread of the mechanical clock is cited by Peter Burke as the other major probable factor affecting attitudes to history and time. Of course there had been clocks before, um, but until the 12th, 13th century all clocks were moved by natural forces by water or the sun or uh, by sand um, and this was in a way just a capturing of nature's rhythms. The idea that time was independent of nature, that it moved in a mechanical way, tick tock, tick tock, that it could be split into smaller and smaller units, minutes, seconds and measured very precisely that it passed, the clock went round and the days went round and never could be retrieved, is both a cause and a consequence of the mechanization of time. Time even takes on a sound. Before you couldn't really perceive time, but now, and water clocks and uh, sundials don't give you a sense of the sound of time, but mechanical clocks have a sound the ticking of the seconds and the minutes. So humans become very aware of the passing of time. Um, the anthropologist Kroeber provides some interesting material on the development of mechanical clocks. They were invented in the West, at least he believes, sometime in the 13th century and spread fairly rapidly in the 14th century. The results were enormous. I quote, clocks permeate our activities to such a degree that we take them for granted. Our civilization ticks to the clock. But the first mechanical clocks were made less than 700 years ago. The ancients, the Chinese and the Hindus, the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians, judged by the sun or by shadows and sun sundials, or followed their unconscious sense of elapsed time. He obviously didn't know as much as we don't do about Chinese clocks, this, uh, the Susung clock. 
uh, of the 13th century, but uh, that disappeared and he's roughly right. Another kind of tool which it's worth considering are, uh, is a set of tools rather, the tools of destruction, the tools of war. It was uh, notoriously the existence of gunpowder along with clocks and the compass as Keith Thomas points out. Uh, this was uh, Bacon's, Francis Bacon's idea which I quote, did most to remind the men of the Renaissance that they could never really recapture the world of the Greeks and Romans. Now gunpowder in itself doesn't do this. None of these things is a necessary and sufficient cause of a new view of time. The inventors of the gunpowder, i.e. the Chinese and the long-term users of it, could accommodate it without, without changing their time system. But its rapid development and the development of firearms in a very dramatic way from the 15th, 16th century onwards not only provided the, one of the basis for European domination and expansion over the globe, but it was in itself a sign of massive change. 17th century soldiers were technologically superior to medieval archers. A new force had come into the world. Related but different are the tools of travel and exploration and particularly the growth in new kinds of ship uh, and the accompanying paraphernalia. In a curious introduction to um, an early 20th century encyclopedia of anthropology called The Peoples of All Nations by the famous early 20th century anthropologist Sir Arthur Keith, there's a picture of a fine sailing ship under which is the following caption most powerful of all the modern weapons of anthropology. Well, I never thought of a sailing ship as a weapon of anthropology till I read this. The subcaption reads, although the discovery of agriculture was the greatest event in the evolution of man, the most potent anthropological weapon ever invented was the long voyage ship, which by threading together the utmost parts of the world, so mixed and interbred its races, as to transform in the course of three centuries the racial aspect of a great area of the globe. Now, whatever we think of the underlying phrasing and their other gross oversimplification since uh, the Silk Road and the Mong Mongols had learned that you could travel quite large distances without ships, uh, it does stress the importance of developments in marine engineering which were indeed of a momentous consequence very considerable improvements in ship construction, the use of cannon, the use of the compass, which again was a Chinese invention, suddenly made it possible to open up the world. Not only to repel the forces from the east, particularly the Turks, began to turn the balance after the Battle of Lepanto in the 17th century, but to go out and to explore. And what this exploration led to, I think, is, is very interesting in relation to a new concept of time. The great period of expansion and recon uh, reconnaissance was after the mid-15th century. The technical background to this is sketched by Parry. I quote, in the later 15th century, new advances in the arts of navigation and cartography map making, made by a new combination of academic knowledge and nautical experience, enabled the explorers for the first time to observe and record the position, or at least the latitude, longitude wasn't um, established until the 18th century, of a point of an unknown coast, and even in favourable circumstances of a ship at sea. New methods in the design of ships consequent upon a marriage of European with Oriental traditions, made it possible for sailors not only to make long voyages of discoveries, but to repeat them, and so to establish regular communications 
with newly discovered lands. New developments in gunnery and the making of guns, particularly in shipborne artillery, gave European explorers a great advantage over the inhabitants of even the most civilized countries to which they sailed, enabled them to defend themselves upon arrival, sometimes against overwhelming numbers, and encouraged them to establish trading posts even in places where they were clearly unwelcome. Now I think what is really interesting about this is that as uh, I discussed in the second lecture at some length, Evans Pritchard and other anthropologists, particularly Evans Pritchard, had this idea that time and space are linked, that as you shift your knowledge of space, your political knowledge and your social knowledge of space, so your concepts of time will be affected. So if you have an idea of a very limited space, you're a tribal group, you move around a small area, he's suggesting, and your social relationships are quite limited. Your, the depth of time you need to account for everything in your world is quite shallow. And this to a certain extent, although of course Europe did know about China and China did know about the West and there were long-term voyages, but on the whole you could get away with a chronology which went back a few thousand years. And you could coordinate through the Roman Greek medieval period your world within the Christian time span or the um, Chinese time span. With Columbus and the expansion outwards, and Columbus is just the symbol of course, space uh, and your knowledge of space expands hugely and I think this changes your concepts of time dramatically as I'll try and show. It requires a deepening of time and this is the first great wave. The same thing happened again with the voyages of Captain Cook and the mapping of the rest of the world which I think underpins and goes along with the new geological interests of the later 18th, early 19th century, to give you suddenly a great deepening, not only of your knowledge of space, but your need for a much deeper sense of time, going backwards hundreds of thousands of years. Of course, the new discoveries in the exploration also gave a great deal of excitement and interest, and a new task to the those who were thinking about how the world works. The tasks of what we would now call sociology, archaeology and anthropology was partly to try and map out these new unknown regions in space and time. Theology and philosophy, which had before claimed to provide the answers, were clearly totally inadequate because many new things were being discovered which weren't within the philosophical and theological traditions of Greek and Christian thought. It's not surprising that there should be a growing interest with origins, with evolution and so on. As time and the origins of man suddenly shot outwards, so you had a new mental task, not merely to document and assimilate, but also to explain and classify all this information. It reaches a high point, as we'll see later, in the second half of the 19th century. But it's beginning in this period. And it also is beginning to affect the idea of progress. We are discovering new things. And if we can discover new things geographically, surely we can discover them mentally. The technological advances, in other words, were combined, I quote here, uh, from Keith Thomas, combined with shifting of the world's features under the impact of the geographical discoveries to make it clear that the world was not the same world as that known by the ancients. The interrelationship, of course, between the discovery and uh, of physically new worlds 
of the and of the discovery of new mental worlds is very complex and not just a simple one-to-one -one relationship and requires further investigation. Here I can only just draw attention to two statements about the possible effects. One is by John Eliot in his uh, book The Old World and the New. He suggests that the idea of the pro possibility of progress or at least change was related to the discovery of America. He writes that, I quote, the discovery, conquest and conversion of the new world did much to reinforce the linear and progressive as against the cyclical interpretation of the histor historical process. In a sense, the turning point is not clocks or printing presses, though all these were developed, but the voyages of Columbus. Of course, there have been earlier discoveries um, of Westerners who travelled, Marco Polo and others, but this was not just a move across Asia to um, fabled lands in the East, but it was a new world, an immense set of interconnected features, of new foods, new customs, new empires and civilizations, new animals, new social organizations, and of course, new diseases, none of which had been known or written about in the Bible or in classical texts. As Shakespeare put it, O oh, brave new world, that has such people in it. In the age of reconnaissance, uh, Parry, that is in the period 1450 to 1650, uh, Parry describes um, the way in which the knowledge of the world was immensely increased. By the end of our period, i.e. by about 1650, European explorers had not only sketched the rough outlines of most of the continents of the world, they had established in every continent, except Australasia and Antarctica, European outposts. Some of these uh, possible effects are rather nicely um, analysed by, again by Robin Horton in relation to the idea of an open science and an open world, and an open predicament, as he calls it. I quote, a second important kind of encounter arises from voyages of travel and exploration, in which members of one community go to live temporarily amongst members of a culturally alien community, with the express aim of intellectual and emotional contact at all levels, from the most superficial to the deepest. In the Western Europe, these voyages were such important features of social life that they covered everyone's outlook on the world. There were, of course, the missionaries, um, who weren't just concerned with spreading the Christian Gospels. Uh, again, I quote Horton, but the more intelligent missionaries saw that effective evangelization required a prior understanding of the face of those to be converted. And they set themselves, however reluctantly, to acquire such an understanding. The result was a body of records of alien worldviews that came to colour much of the thought of the times, and that was undoubtedly one of the most important contributions to the genesis of the open thinking of the 17th century. One more quotation from Horton. The eras of exploration encouraged the growth of the open predicament in a second way. This was through the rich material fruits of the voyages. In traditional cultures, distant lands tended to epitomise all that is new and strange, all that fails to fit into the established system of categories, all that is tabooed, fearful and abominable. But in the eras of exploration, however, reports came back not of monsters, but of delights and riches. Slowly these pleasant associations of the 
great beyond, extended themselves to new and strange experience generally. The quest for such experience came to be seen not as something dangerous and foolhardy, but as something richly rewarding and pleasantly exciting. For example, in Joseph Glanville's Vanity of Dogmatizing, you could find an America of secrets and an unknown Peru of nature. Now, now, the new discoveries were terribly important for anthropology. Um, it's difficult to realize how recent our uh, knowledge of most of the world in any depth is. Um, new Zealand, for example, was not so much as cited, it's, at least I, I'm told, before 1642. And uh, Oceania is really not um, encountered in any depth of Winville and Cook in the 18th century. Uh, little more than uh, a century ago, our best maps showed a huge gap in the Belgian Congo, for example, much of it unmapped. How could anyone survey humanity even superficially um, until at least the location of different parts was determined? For example, another big shock was the discovery of Australia, where, uh, which disclosed a new race and all sorts of strange species of animals and plants. Thus, until these discoveries, the world seemed closed and cyclical. Now it began to feel open and progressive. Two other effects can be pointed out. The discoveries, I quote, called attention this is um, Keith Thomas, called attention to new and far-reaching, um, sorry, this is Robert Lowy's History of Anthropology, uh, called attention to new um, and far-reaching problems in the social sciences, in economics, in anthropology, and in the arts of government, in all branches of science, as the Renaissance proceeded and became less tentative, as the European picture of the world became fuller and more detailed, so the idea of continually expanding knowledge became more familiar. In other words, it was not merely a, a matter of rediscovery of ancient wisdom, of circularity. There were new things, I quote to Keith Thomas, there is more in heaven and earth than is dreamt of in your philosophy. Um, or at least I quote Keith Thomas on Shakespeare. It's tempting to connect th this with changes in the sciences. In science, this is Thomas, in science the newly perceived infinity of worlds reinforced the belief in the possibility of infinite intellectual progress, while the shift from the timelessness of Aristotelian perfect bodies to the acceptance of movement and change was the essence of the revolution in physics. So the, the ac very academic disciplines are interrelated with much wider changes in the exploration of the world. Another feature of this is that it became increasingly difficult to be certain the vanity of dogmatizing, as uh, Glanville put it. By the end of the century, and I quote here Keith Thomas again, by the end of the century it was increasingly apparent that men were doing more than simply treading the paths of their ancestors. For Robert Boyle it was impossible to construct a complete system of truth because at any given moment things were still happening and new phenomena might refute previous hypotheses, most famously his discovery of the vacuum. I mean, uh, nature abhors a vacuum, there should not be vacuum, a vacuum, but he actually created one completely overthrowing all the classical knowledge. Put in other terms, this could be seen as the movement from a closed 
world, to an open society in Popper, Karl Popper or Horton's sense. There were many new things under the sun. The numbering of the bird, beasts and the foods and continents of the ancients was not sufficient, just as their, the system of astronomy and the laws of physics were not sufficient as they had been inherited. And obviously Copernicus and Galileo are part of all this. One of the interesting facts to emerge, however, is what a huge change was required to shift from this closed linear to open linear world. If the discoveries had been less stupendous and less rapid over some centuries, it might have been absorbed. In the two and a half centuries after 1450, however, the era area of the known world much more than doubled. As Parry put it, they found vast territories formerly unknown to them and drew the rough outlines of the world which we know. The age saw the most rapid extension of geographical knowledge in the whole of human history. Vote summarizes the effects of the discovery and conquest on anthropology. The ideas of Renaissance scholars were challenged by the discovery, conquest and settlement of the new world, which introduced them to peoples who had not been present at the creation and who apparently had no connection with the ancient world or with Christian history. Practical considerations regarding the Christianization and administration of these strange peoples heightened a curiosity to learn about their character, dress and their customs. The urge to give, them, give these alien peoples a place in the Christian creation and history led to comparisons of their customs, their tools, their musical instruments, their dress, their beliefs and ceremonies with those of the ancient world particularly with the Hebrews. In this way, a vision of a universal Christian history took on the character of a comparative Christian ethnology or anthropology. But the discoveries in and of themselves were not sufficient to cause the change. As Parry warns us, we must not see too immediate and obvious an influence. I quote, even with evidence before their eyes that seamen were in fact finding lands formerly unknown and unsuspected, learned men were slow to draw analogies in other fields of inquiry. The idea that there was an America of learning and understanding beyond the horizon of the classics, ancient philosophy and the teachings of religion was still in those years new and strange the vision of comparatively few men. But uh, a few people did begin to draw the conclusions and a century or so later, for instance, Montesquieu in 1721 speculated on the significance of the discovery in Java of gliding animals, which in a theory of gradation, as in the Bible, could be regarded as halfway in the conversion of bats into monkeys. Well, this is dangerous talk at that time. Halfway between bats and monkeys, is there some sort of evolution going on? Not in a biblical sense. This, he said, would seem to confirm my feelings that the difference between species of animals can increase and decrease. In the beginning, there were very few species and they have multiplied since. Now that's straight. Darwinian evolution of a kind and written in 1721 it's a pretty heretical idea and indeed Montesquieu himself was often very frightened of being accused of a, being a heretic and published his books outside the area of the Inquisition. There is in fact a very complex relationship between major paradigm shifts and the impact of new information it's clearly not the case that the external world forces is a necessary and sufficient cause for a change. 
Yet new discoveries are also made because of new interests. It's a cyclical thing. You become interested in discovering things and you discover things. People see a new world as they move around. Hence the voyage of the Beagle with Darwin. Hence at the end of the 19th century in Cambridge the Torres Straits expedition of the anthropologists led by Haddon. The explorations of Levi-Strauss in Brazil Marx in 19th century England, all sorts of inquisitive people looking around them, were partly discovering old things, but also seeing things in a new way, as Kuhn suggested in relation to physics. It's clearly as much, if not much, a climate of opinion which makes the old explanations seem old-fashioned and encourages people to look for the new. Proof of this is that there are associated shifts in a number of different disciplines at about the same time. That's why it's a paradigmatic shift. Thus, we have um, all sorts of shifts going on within, across Europe in religion, in social structure, and considerable variations within Europe. The complexity of the change from circular, closed time and history to linear, open, is shown by the fact that even within medieval thought and earlier thought, there had been a tension, there had been some strong underpinning ideas of the progress of time. And we can see this if we look at the Christian tradition because Christianity is a, a rather strange religion. Most religions, most philosophies are closed. That is to say, once the great thinker, the Buddha, the Confucius, uh, the prophet, uh, Aristotle or whatever have made their sayings, uh, nothing then is going to happen uh, except their followers are going to uh, look back to them and try and live up to their standards. Christ came and uh, was crucified, but then he was reborn and he was the redeemer of mankind because one day the second coming would happen. In the future, history would start, or at least end in the future, and until then human beings had to pursue the sayings of Christ in the hope that they would reach this everlasting life in the future. This is put, for instance, by Hay. He says, in the first place, for a Jew and for a Christian, history was not repetitive, not repetitive or cyclical, as it had been for the few Greek and Romans who had thought about the matter. Nor was it a story of decline from a period of primitive innocence to one of degenerative corruption. And this despite the attractive parallels between the age of gold and the paradise, the Christian paradise, despite the analogy which some ancients and some early Christians drew between the ages of man and the ages of human history. For it was into an aging world that the Redeemer had come. The Jewish and the Christian scheme was linear. It moved from a beginning, the creation, to an end when a Messiah would rule. For the Jew who rejected Christ, the linear pattern had no discernible end, although an end there would have to be. For the Christian, the end was, if not precisely in sight, at least determined. So, as he, uh, Hay also writes, the linear concept of history not only involved the end of history, sooner or later, it have had other momentous consequences. In some sense it involved a notion of progress, although this was totally different from the simple ideas developed in the 18th and 19th centuries, for it involved progression to a divinely ordained conclusion. One other uh, aspect which is worth uh, noting 
is that the trade travel complex and the movement of peoples speeded up and it particularly um, centered at the beginning on the Mediterranean, on Portugal uh, as a great uh, discovery nation, uh, on Italy, on Venice, on the trade links which came in from the east and the west and from Africa and elsewhere, a melting pot as we would now call it of different cultures. And Horton notes that this open predicament, the idea that you have to live lo alongside other world views and other customs, seems to flourish in trading communities. Perhaps that's why some of it is foreshadowed in ancient Greece um, and it is foreshadowed in the Arabia, the Iberian Peninsula and in coastal Italy and finally moves to Northwest Europe as that area becomes the great um, link between the New World and the Old. Why is this so? Well, Horton, um, with his African experience, writes, whereas in Africa intercultural boundaries tended to coincide with intercommunity boundaries, in other words, tribes, in these Mediterranean and European cities they cut right through the middle of the community. In these centres, peoples of diverse origins and cultures were packed together within single urban communities. Under these conditions, relations between bearers of different cultures were much broader in scope than the purely commercial relations which typically linked such people over much of traditional Africa. And I've often thought that um, the greatness of some of the 18th century Enlightenment figures, Montesquieu, who was, uh, lived near a southern French trading city, and uh, Adam Smith, who spent time talking to sailors and seamen in Glasgow, the new knowledge that was coming into these places and the mixed communities of um, parts of Europe led to speculation and a jolt to accustomed views. The consequences of the new discoveries can be seen in various ways. Uh, people began to see that things like laws, customs, government, agriculture were all not closed, but there were new ways of doing these things. For example, uh, White's famous pa paintings of the American Indians showed not the cycle of the seasons of Europe but simultaneous agriculture because of the climate. You could grow different stages of the same crop in the same area at the same time. Um, and you could find there were these new crops like maize, uh, millet and so on coming from the new world, tobacco sugar and the rest of them. In some technological and geographical changes during the period 1450 to 1650 were in combination so dramatic both in the speed at which they occurred and their huge internal um, features to give the sufficient jolt to change the whole view of the world and its development. There was a sense of difference that we live in a relative world. Our deepest assumptions, as Montaigne uh, famously described in his essays, our deepest assumptions are not the assumptions of other cultures. And the first scientific and intellectual revolution, therefore, had been achieved out of a double comparison, because this is the beginning of the growth of science. To conclude, a late 17th century European could now begin to feel not only that their world was different from the past, but also from other, diff from other worlds. Hence we begin to get in this period the growth of new forms of history, the discovery of the fact that other civilizations differ in principle. For example, the discovery of the idea of feudalism, which is a, an invention according to Pocock of the late 
17th century, the very the term feudalism. A feeling of the Middle Ages, a new invention of an idea, the medium avon, uh, which suggests there's a Middle Ages and now there is a modern world which is different, both from classical antiquity and from the Middle Ages. A feeling that there were periods, a sense of anachronism. And then there is a feeling of difference from other worlds and their customs. All sorts of strange people with civilizations and customs very different from our own were being found. This gave a real sense of shock and undermined many of the assumptions. These other people's marriages, their sexual habits, their gods, their eating habits, their sense of decency and dress all became subjects of interest and speculation. Just as there were real, discrete differences in time, so there were in space. A summary of the vast amount of new information that was coming in was synthesized for the first time in, really, by Montesquieu in his Spirit of the Laws in the middle of the 18th century. But the kind of shock that people had can be seen, for instance, in a late 17th century commentary on marriage by an English writer, William Lawrence, in 1680. He says, the Arabians, Britons and other nations, to the intent that one family might not by marriage gifts rob another, always married in the same family, and brothers and sisters married, making that religion, making that religion to marry in a family, which others made incest, and that incest to marry out of a family, which others made religion at a deep taboo level. Other cultures believed that what we considered to be taboos was exactly what you had to do. There is a, here a quiet anthropological relativism and a lack of horror, shock and disgust, which is a hallmark of this period and will be encapsulated in the quotation I give from Montaigne at the end. The central feature is the growth of curiosity and wonder. Of course, the horrors of the conquest of South America and elsewhere were often justified by a feeling of Christian or other superiority. But for a while there was a feeling in relation to the past and to other lands of some admiration, and even as before China, of deference, certainly of equality and difference. And you see this in the 18th century. For example, Leonard Wolfe, writes in relation to India. It is important to notice that up to the middle of the 18th century, the relations of European traders and their governments with Indian rulers were in no sense imperialist. Asiatic territory and Asiatic governments were treated in the same way as European territory and governments. Great Britain or France made treaties with Indian rulers as they did with European kings and emperors. And you see this uh, in McCartney's late 18th century mission uh, to China. Uh, you're dealing with people on the same power level as yourself. They're different. I've put this quotation of Montaigne's at the end because it's very long and uh, viewers can switch off now if they want. It could probably go on for five or ten minutes. But it's so wonderful. Uh, it's also interesting because I, the copy of the book I'm reading, Montaigne's Essays, is belonged to the great anthropologist Maya Fortes, and he took a photocopy of that, which I have here, um, obviously used it in lectures, and has sidelined this passage particularly, because it shows the kind of shock uh, of uh, Europeans and the relativity and urbanity of uh, the great Montaigne in contemplating the variations in humankind, which in many ways has been the theme of anthropology since. So listen as long as you'd like. There are countries where no one except his wife and children speak to the king except through a tube. In one and the same nation, young girls openly show their parts and the married women carefully hide them. To this custom is related another practiced elsewhere 
Chastity is prized only in wedlock, for the girls may abandon themselves at their pleasure and when pregnant openly procure an abortion by means of special drugs. And in another place, if a tradesman marries, all the other tradesmen invited to the wedding anticipate him with the bride, and the more there are of them, the more she is honoured and commended for her vigour and capacity. If an officer marries, it is the same, and the same in the case of a noble. In some countries there are public brothels of males, and even marriages between them. There are countries where women go to the wars together with their husbands, and share not only in the fighting, but in the command where they wear not only rings through their noses, lips, cheeks, and on their toes, but very heavy gold rods thrust, thrust through their breasts and buttocks, where, when eating, they wipe their fingers on their thighs, their testicles, and the soles of their feet, where the inheritance goes not to the children, but to brothers and nephews, and elsewhere, to the nephews only, saving in the succession of the prince. Where, to regulate the community of goods that is there practised, certain chief magistrates take in hand the cultivation of all the lands and the distribution of the fruits according to each one's needs. Where they mourn at the death of children and feast when old men die where they sleep in beds ten or a dozen together with their wives, where women who lose their husband by a violent death may remarry, but not the others, where women are so little esteemed that female children are killed at birth, and men buy women of their neighbours for their need, where husbands may repudiate their neighbours, uh, their wives, without showing any cause but the women may not do so for any cause whatsoever. Where the husbands are permitted to sell them if they are barren. Where they boil the body of a deceased person and then pound it to a pulp, which is then mixed with their wine and drunk. Where the most desirable sepulture is to be devoured by dogs, in other places by birds where they believe that the souls of the blessed live in their all freedom in pleasant fields furnished with all good things and that from them proceeds the echo we hear. Where they fight in the water and draw their bow with sure aim while swimming. Where as a sign of subjection they have to raise their shoulder and bow their heads and remove their shoes when entering the king's palace. Where the eunuchs who guard the religious women are minus nose and lips that they may not inspire love, and the priests put out their own eyes in order to communicate with their demons and receive their oracles. Where every man makes to himself a god of what he pleases, the hunter of a lion or a fox, the fishermen of a certain fish, and idols are made of every human action or passion. The sun, moon, and earth are the principal gods, and the form of taking an oath is to touch the earth while looking at the sun, and flesh and fish are eaten raw. Where the most solemn oath is to swear by the name of some dead person who was held in good repute in the country, the while touching his tomb with one hand and so on. That's about half of it. If you're interested in the rest, do read um, Montesquieu's, uh, Montaigne's essays, um, in this case the uh, edition uh, I've got is the one translated by Trechman, T-R-E-C-H-M-A-N, um, and it's in the essay on strange customs and in my edition pages 107 onwards. Uh, wonderful stuff, wonderfully written and interesting.
and as are his other essays.